All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Digital Literacy Forum. My name is Andrea Lewandowski. I'm the Library Consultant for Small Business Development and Technology at the New Jersey State Library. It's so good to see all of you here today. Um, we have a really exciting and interesting panel um, and we're going to be exploring um, uh, career progress through digital skills, workforce development, and digital literacy. So um, before I introduce everyone, I do want to just thank all of our speakers and panelists for your participation to explore this topic and to share your expertise for the benefit of New Jersey's libraries. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank the members of the Lifelong Learning Department, Michelle Stricker, Mimi Lee, and Sharon Rollins for your support during today's program. Mimi and Sharon, do you want to say a quick hello to everyone? Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> they'll be in the chat. They'll be around. Um, so, uh, you know, this is definitely a team effort uh, for this entire forum. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, our state librarian, Jennifer Nelson, for making this event happen and for guiding New Jersey's libraries in shaping the role in digital literacy services. Um, so before I begin, I do have um, some slides, so welcome. Uh, just as a reminder that um, this is part of a series and that there is still time to register for tomorrow and Friday's sessions. Um, tomorrow is Youth Services and Digital Literacy and Friday is Health Literacy and Telehealth. And the um, recording from uh, yesterday is already up on the website and I'm going to put the link into the chat if you miss that or you want to share it. This is where all of the recordings will be shared. Um, so you can see today's recording um, by the end of today. Um, our plan for today, we'll have our keynote um, and a panel discussion followed by Q&A, but you can type the Q&A. If you have questions, you can put them into either the Q&A the, or the chat during the session. And we'll try to answer what we can in chat or bring things to the panel later on when we have an opportunity. And then thank you again for being here. Um, Mimi had a picture of a dog, so I had to show a picture of my cat. Um, so um, I'm, like I said, I'm really looking forward to, to today's session. And the reason is really because workforce development and job seeker assistance are important aspects of library services to their communities, which we all recognize. Um, and the reason and rationale for exploring how digital literacy fits into these services is also pretty clear. Digital skills make people more desirable to employers. Digital skills help people locate job opportunities and complete online applications. And digital skills allow people to acquire new skills and advance in their careers. However, accurately assessing needs, figuring out best practices, and putting successful programs into place is less simple and straightforward. We will take a closer look at these topics and more during this session. And while we may not walk away knowing all of the answers, I hope that this session will give you all ideas or at least things to think about and maybe even some new questions to ask. So without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to introduce our um, keynote. Dr. Gregory Porambescu is an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers University, Newark, where he is also the Associate Director of the Transparency and Governance Center. He received his PhD from Seoul National University in South Korea. Currently, Dr. Porambescu's research examines psychological determinants of the digital divide and the role digital literacy training can play in promoting digital equity. His research has been funded by the Korean Research Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the New Jersey Office of the Secretary of Higher Education, and appeared in outlets such as the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory, Public Administration Review, Government Information Quarterly, Social Science and Medicine, and the Washington Post. So thank you so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Okay, so I should share my screen. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Andrea, and for um, you and, and everyone else putting together the event. So I'm assuming you can see this now, right? Great. Um, so I'm also unmuted, which is great. Uh, so 
Um, yeah, so thanks again for the invitation. It's, it's, it's not only an honor, but a real pleasure to be here today with everyone. Um, this is, you know, it's, it's an important topic, one that I'm, I'm super interested in. Um, so, so I really look forward to the conversation today. Um, so, so the presentation is, is you know, is, is, is apparent from digital literacy to digital equity. This is, you know, I had hoped to have data, um, but I work in a big state bureaucracy and I myself am, am very, very slow moving. So when these forces meet, um, yeah, we don't have data yet. Uh, so instead I'll be sharing some background research that's been conducted. Um, this is coming from the Digital Equity Initiative that's operated under the auspices of the uh, New Jersey State Policy Lab. Um, it, the Digital Equity Initiative is, is, is managed by myself and uh, Andrea Hetling, who's a professor in this uh, Blaustein in New Brunswick. And we have some excellent um, graduate assistant support from uh, Stephanie Holcomb, who's on the call now, I see, uh, Vishal Trahan and, um, and Jessica Cruz. So this is a joint effort. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll get started. There we go. Um, so we wouldn't all be here today if we didn't acknowledge the importance of digital skills. Um, I think as we as we spent you know the the first couple of hours of this day, um, we've probably done a lot of things <laughs> that are technology related. We've probably relied on that. Many of us would be asleep if it weren't for technology, right? Our phones, etc. Um, so I think as as we might all acknowledge. Um, Technology plays such an outsized role in our life today that it's hard to imagine what we do without it, um, how we would function, how things would be different, um, and, and how we'd maintain some level of well-being. I think one of the interesting things, however, is that during, during the most recent, you know, the most recent, during the pandemic, um, what we saw is, or what we acknowledged was that you know, over the course of maybe 20 or 30 years, there was this gradual progression of technology penetrating different aspects of our life, right? Um, from, I remember the first time I saw an iPhone, right? My, my friend had it. He also, his parents owned a jewelry store. So it's natural that he would be the, the early adapter in this case. Um, but we, we see technology gradually penetrating every single aspect of our life. The digital, the um, the recent pandemic really illustrated this um, very poignantly, unfortunately, um, from access to healthcare to, to the ability to work remotely, um, to education, to maintaining healthy relationships and, and, and you, know, a, a, you know, a safe mental state for many of us. Um, you know, my, my mother wasn't able to travel. Our, we had our firstborn uh, during the pandemic. Much of our family wasn't able to come and everything was done by Zoom. I can't imagine what it would have been like without it. Um, but what we also learned through the pandemic was that there is a significant digital divide, and we knew that this is, is, is present in society and it's affecting folks, but what I think we didn't, we didn't hear the stories that we heard during the pandemic, we didn't see the figures, right, and one of them um, comes to mind, and, and perhaps you all have seen it too, which is, is the graph of sort of earnings over the course of the pandemic, where those who come from more affluent backgrounds continue to do well, um, and those who were from more disadvantaged segments of society saw a real nosedive in their income, especially during the shutdowns and lockdowns. Um, and in large part, I think the explanation behind these, these divergent trends, these two pandemics, so to speak, was, was digital divide, right? Access to technology and the ability to use it. So those who, who were able, who had access to technology and the knowledge of how to use technology were able to, to navigate the divide and maintain some semblance of a normal life uh, amidst the chaos, whereas others who didn't have this really suffered much more. Uh, now, I think what we also sort of saw from, from the pandemic was that digital skills and, and this digital divide is an outgrowth of uh, long-standing social inequities, right? Um, that is that the digital divide is, is it's distributed heterogeneously across the population. Um, it's concentrated in disadvantaged communities, in minoritized, in, in communities with, with um, 
where the majority rep represents um, members of minor minoritized groups. Um, you know, what we saw was that Black and Hispanic uh, adults living in the U.S., residents, they had a more difficult time accessing technology. Um, subsequently, the ability to use that technology to advance one's well-being, to thrive, to, to obtain medical care, and things like that, um, also fell along these lines. And, and the same is true for individuals who come from socioeconomically distressed backgrounds. So, so in essence, what we saw is that the digital divide was in many instances making more apparent, crystallizing, or even exaggerating existing inequities that we see in society, um, which, which rightfully led to a lot of um, alarm ringing, right? And hand wringing over, over what are we gonna do about this? Because um, the, you can read the statistics there, they're awfully difficult to understand, but the bottom line is, is that, you know, individuals who come from, from vulnerable groups who have historically had difficulty accessing jobs, accessing government, participating in government, doing things that, that um, you know, members of more affluent social groups come from, these individuals who come from more vulnerable segments of, of society are going to be immensely disadvantaged by the digitalization of society. Good, I had my coffee. The digitalization of society is going to have a tremendous outsized impact on the well-being, um, negative impact on the well-being of these groups. Um, so with that then, um, you know, from, from that, that sort of nugget of, of um, pessimism, I think uh, I'll introduce the, the basic premise for, for the talk today, which is that um, it's good news, right? In, in part, because the sky is not falling. Um, while there is cause for concern, and these concerns are certainly very valid and need to be, you know, we need to be thinking about them. Um, there are a lot of important steps that are already being taken. Uh, but I would also submit that maintaining the momentum we need to successfully confront um, this digital divide requires standardizing and aggregating knowledge. We need to do a better job at sharing knowledge. Um, so, so one of the, the surprising things for me is I, I started to sort of embark in this, in this body of literature. Initially, I was, I was doing e-government research, and, and I, I was really interested in topics of transparency and trust. These are very intractable concepts, right? They're big ideas. They're fuzzy. They're enigmatic, even. Um, but there are measures of them, and there are validated measures of them. The interesting thing about digital equity is that the measures of digital, uh, sorry, digital literacy is that the measures of digital literacy are all over the place. Um, there's not a unified approach to measuring digital literacy. And as a researcher, I just found that fascinating. Um, so so the, the more interesting part is, and I'll get to this now, is, is that despite sort of the, the heterogeneity, I'm using that word a lot, uh, but despite the diversity and measures of uh, digital literacy, there is a consensus on what digital literacy is. And, and we'll talk about that now. So what do we mean by digital literacy? Um, I think a, a quick Google will show you that there's a consensus building around the American Librarians Association definition, which is that digital literacy is the ability to use information and communications technology to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. Uh, so, so we can infer two important things from this definition. The first is that digital literacy is it's, it's contingent, right? It's contingent on access to digital technologies. We can't begin to develop digital literacy until we have the tools um, to develop to digital literacy using, right? Um, the second is that there are two driving forces, cognitive skills and technical skills. So in essence, when we think about digital literacy, it's a function of two underlying skill sets. Now, I don't personally, I, I don't think cognitive is a, is a loaded term, cognitive skills. I prefer the term capacity. Um, and, and that's where I think we'll head in, in, in our work. Um, so we can think about digital literacy as, as consisting of, of components of capacity and technical skills. So again, getting to, to definition. Um, what do we mean by capacity? Capacity essentially refers to generic traits that make technical skill acquisition easier. 
Um, so we can think about things like education, general literacy, uh, our ability to read and write. Um, and, and this has received some attention, but what I think is also very important and, and has received less attention is disposition towards technology, right? Things like trust in government, in technology, the perceived utility of technology, right? So, so we can think about um, maybe more elderly segments of the population who just refuse to use online banking, right? Um, there's an opportunity cost there and the benefits of using online banking don't outweigh the learning costs and the opportunity costs, right? The time they have to spend to, to learn new things. So the, so the, the, the benefit there is, is, is moot. So they don't use technology, right? And therefore um, there's, you know, there's not really, there doesn't need to be a conversation about digital skills. Trust is a very interesting one. Um, it came to light, I was, I was in a community group um, in, in, you know, with, with representatives, I forget from where in, in Northern New Jersey. And, and it was fascinating because what we, what, what this research group wanted to do was to give members of the community tablets and then, and then basically monitor a couple of things, ask them a couple of questions and, and help them in, in a couple of different ways. And one of the, one of the participants basically said, nobody's going to use the tablets because we, you know, we don't want you spying on us. And it was fascinating, right? Like here's a $300 tablet and you just don't want it because you don't trust the technology or maybe you don't trust us, but trust plays a very, very important role in, in our decisions to use technology. And, and we, you know, Edward Snowden sort of taught us some of this too. Um, then we can transition into technical skills, right? So technical skills are one's ability to use technology to find, evaluate, communicate information and create information. So here we all, we've also got two dimensions, um, which are basic skills. Basic skills are easily transferable, right? So these are things like um, charging devices. If you know how to charge a printer, you know how to charge a computer, you know how to charge a phone, as you know, maybe Homer Simpson doesn't know, but we know that it, you know, we can type on our keyboards, whether they're touch keyboards or, or analog keyboards or, or what have you. Um, we know how to use uh, Microsoft Word or, or Microsoft Excel to engage in basic data entry to, to, to communicate information and things like that. Context skills are a bit different, right? So context skills are an outgrowth of basic skills and they're function dependent. So these relate to creating information and more sophisticated communication of information. Here we might think about using software for specific tasks. So we might use Excel and Excel, we'll use Excel here. Um, we might use Excel for basic data entry and to some columns and things like that, basic skill. Um, whereas a context or function dependent skill would be using Excel for accounting purposes or, or some sort of data analysis, right? We, we can run regressions using Excel. Um, and, and that requires a more of an investment in time and, and, and um, specific knowledge. Cookies are another example, right? So knowing which cookies you would like to accept and you feel comfortable, these play a role in, in, in the function of protecting your personal privacy and, and limiting risks. Uh, so just to illustrate then, so we've essentially covered four dimensions of digital literacy, capacity consisting of um, disposition and, and generic literacy, and technical skills, which consist of basic skills and, and context skills. And I think what, what we see in practice, what makes sense in practice is that all of these different components are simultaneously weighing on digital literacy. They simultaneously determine our ability to use technology to, to carry out various tasks and perform various functions. Um, so we, you know, today we're talking about jobs and, and workforce development. But, but we, can, we can easily see how, how basic skills and more advanced skills, context-driven skills, shape our ability to find jobs, prepare application materials, apply for jobs, and once we've got the jobs, do the work. Um, so I, I tried to make this nice summary figure, but then I just kept making it more complicated, but hopefully um, you can see it without the screen getting in the way. Um, but essentially what, we're, what we propose then is a tiered understanding of digital literacy, where at the bottom you have sort of these generic skills and capacity, right? Basic literacy um, and knowledge. And this, this transitions into basic skills. It sets a foundation for basic skill acquisition, basic technical skill acquisition, 
which in turn forms a foundation for, for context-driven skills. So if we're an accountant, we might know, you know, we've read lots of accounting books. We know what accounting is and how it works. Um, developing basic tech, technical skills would be uh, using some of those skills, applying some of those skills um, in Excel for basic bookkeeping functions. Um, and, and more context-driven skills would then be actually doing accounting using Excel, using more advanced skills. Um, now, one other thing I think that's important to note that the pyramid uh, somehow allows us to illustrate is that really socio socioeconomic disparities in digital literacy are, are most, um, most influential at the base. They shape capacity, right? They shape attitudes towards technology and they shape basic education. We're all well aware of, of educational disparities in the state of New Jersey and around the United States. Um, so, so this essentially creates something of a path dependency that then influences subsequent um, skill ac acquisition. So if we have digital literacy then as sort of this, this, this big idea, um, the next thing obviously we, we wanna do is, is to evaluate how digitally literate someone is. Uh, this, this means that, that we need to be doing two things. We need to be measuring and then subsequently judging or evaluating um, levels of digital literacy. Um, and I, I, I've, I've done a bit of reading and I, I'd rather, not that I'm qualified, but I'd, rather than reviewing everything out there, I think it's, it's, it's better just to kind of review two important challenges um, in terms of measurement and evaluation for improving digital literacy. So we'll start with, with the first, which is, is measurement. Um, digital literacy, as, as, as we're proposing, is a multidimensional construct, right? It has different elements. And what we know is that mul measuring multidimensional constructs is really, really, really tricky. It's very difficult. Educational attainment, you know, uh, college aptitude is very, very difficult to measure. How prepared somebody is to go to college is, is, is extremely tough. Um, and, and lots of people are critical of the SAT because it only uses verbal and quantitative reasoning. And, and, and the, the pushback is that actually, you know, college preparedness consists of many more dimensions than that. And how accurate are our verbal and quantitative scores in measuring real, real life quantitative and verbal reasoning capacity and skills? Um, the same is true for, for measuring digital literacy, right? Um, <clears throat> How do, we, how, how do we create concise parsimonious measures of, of capacity, basic skills, and technical skills? Um, and I think part of, the, part of the issue that we're experiencing is in response to this, this complexity in measuring digital literacy, everyone just kind of does their own thing, right? Um, there are lots of different approaches to measuring digital literacy, and oftentimes um, these frameworks omit the type of literacy or the issue, the particular issue that they're addressing. Um, basic skills, capacity, more context specific skills. Um, relatedly, these frameworks tie measurement to specific training programs, right? So each training program offers its own evaluation framework or its own measurement framework. But how well these measures predict real world functionality, how they perform in the real world is totally unclear. And, and um, you know, if, if anyone in the audience is aware of any sort of information on this, I, you know, please, please find me because I'm, I'm very eager to, to know this, right? Um, to, to see whether the, you know, is this, is this just my gap in knowledge or is this reality? But from the best of my knowledge, um, I'm aware of, of, of any efforts to validate training specific or program specific uh, measurement frameworks to real world functions. It's just sort of apply, uh, implied. So in essence, then what we're talking about here is a lack of a shared language, right? We're, we're talking about apples and oranges. If we're, if we're assessing or comparing two individuals in terms of how digitally literate they are, what's the evidence we're using to evaluate them? And what makes our, you know, how, how can we be sure that we're comparing them on dimensions of digital literacy and not something else? Um, we, we know, for example, um, teaching evaluations are, are, are a very apt illustration of this because teaching evaluations appear to measure everything except um, how effective a teacher is in instructing students, right? They measure looks, they measure how nice the teacher is, they measure the grades to date. Um, 
but but when we're comparing teachers on teaching evaluations, what are we actually comparing them on? It's not teaching efficacy, then what is it, right? So with flawed measures come flawed comparisons. Um, <clears throat> so the next challenge is the evaluation challenge. Um, and I think this is this is relatively apparent. Without validated measures, how do we know what works? Right? Um, we we I think oftentimes we we make decisions based off of anecdotes and compelling stories. And, and there's a lot of evidence from psychology that this is totally normal. But there's also a lot of evidence from psychology that that doesn't always lead to the best outcomes. Um, I think the lack of measurement creates particular challenges when we talk about curriculum development for digital, digital literacy initiatives, right? When we talk about what to include and what not to include, or how to convey different topics or illustrate specific ideas, what's the basis for, for inclusion, right? Oftentimes, things that we think make sense in the classroom don't. Oftentimes, things that we think are going to work or things that work for other people perform very poorly for others. So what's the evidentiary basis for deciding how to, to perform some sort of digital literacy initiative or training program? Um, relatedly, uh, you know, we all operate in resource-constrained contexts. So when we have to decide what we want to invest in, what's the basis for, for determining how we want to invest our scarce resources, either financial or human resources, um, to address digital literacy issue concerns, right? Again, so what's the evidentiary basis for allocating resources? And, and I'll submit, and, and I'm very happy to be wrong on this, but I'll submit that the evidentiary basis is very weak. Um, so, so then chunking it up a level and thinking about this from a, from a, a big picture perspective, um, Measurement and evaluation challenges, I, I have an errant R there. Uh, measurement and evaluation challenges, challenges slow the pace of progress, right? They, they, they impede our ability to, to promote digital equity by addressing, the digi by, by addressing or improving digital literacy um, because they make it more difficult to exchange best practices. Right? It's one thing to get together and have beers and talk about good ideas. It's another thing to, to build entire policies around having beers and talking about good ideas. Not that that's what I'm, you know, I'm, you know that's a hyperbole, but um, I think the reasoning stands. So knowledge exchange ben and benchmarking are far more efficient um, ways of, of aggregating knowledge and building out um, curricula. Than, than everybody just sort of tinkering on their own and figuring things out independently, right? So um, we'll, we'll conclude with, you know, I, I've sort of outlined some challenges um, that flow from, from efforts to, to address digital literacy. Um, and I'd be remiss not to, to kind of at least speculate on ways of addressing those challenges. Um, so, so we can think about three steps to improve digital literacy and promote digital equity. Um, the first being kind of the, the, the most obvious, which is, well, we have to improve measurement. Um, we need to do a better job of, of, of standardizing our knowledge. We should see measurement as a tool for standardizing and facilitating the exchange of information. If we don't have standard metrics, then how do we, you know, if we, if we go to the supermarket and we buy a fistful of meat, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not a good way of doing things. Um, so we, we really need standardized metrics of digital literacy if we're to evaluate progress. Otherwise, we're just kind of, we're, we're, we're sort of kicking around in the dark a little bit. Um, in turn, this necessitates careful problem definition, right? Um, I think in, in statistics, we, sometimes we talk about overfitting your model, right? So, so when you poke around on, on some of the websites, some of the training programs, they have very, very sophisticated measures of digital literacy. There's multiple, um, multiple components to these training programs, which is great because they acknowledge the, the need uh, and, and the diversity uh, that's in that, that um, represents digital skills. Um, but, but sometimes that complexity results in, in very, very accurate measurements of a training program and less accurate insights into how well somebody who completes a training program is going to perform in the wild, right? Um, so this is to say that 
rather than focusing our performance measurement efforts on uh, our, our measurement efforts on on retaining information and 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 students or or trainees' ability to hold on to information that they've got from a particular training program, we should be much more careful about thinking how these particular measurement frameworks map on to, to real world skills. This is to say that we need to be really thinking not about evaluating programs, um, but, but evaluating real world skill sets. So the final point is, is experimentation, right? Um, so, so progress is incremental. Digital literacy is a huge social issue and it's not gonna be solved overnight. It's gonna be small, you know, solutions to big problems are small. And there's just a lot of them. So we're not going to see a silver bullet that, that one day just fixes digital literacy once and for all. What we need to do over time is acknowledge that this is going to be an ongoing effort. Progress is incremental. And that incremental progress is premised upon a, a high quality base of, of, of evidence, right? Again, otherwise, we're, we're kicking around in the dark, we're replicating efforts, and we're doing things very, very inefficiently. And of course, when we do things so inefficiently, this stalls the pace of progress. And as I think the earlier slides demonstrated, stalling the pace of progress has significant concern, significant um, causes significant issues for, for questions of digital equity, right? It, it prolongs suffering and, and further exclusion. Now, I think uh, given that we're convened here by librarians and probably most of the people here are librarians, um, you know, it's good to give a shout out and, and, and acknowledge um, that I think libraries are doing tremendous work in, in this experimentation domain through my own conversations with Andrea and others and, and, and librarians at Rutgers Newark. Um, I think libraries are on the cutting edge of, of, of experimentation and of trying to, to kind of address some of these issues in, in, in um, improving the evidentiary basis for decision-making as it relates to digital literacy. Um, so with that then, um, lots of sort of, um, there's some pessimism and some complaining, you know, the academics love to be the Eeyore uh, of a room, uh, but I, I think we can close on a, a more optimistic note, which is, is that, you know, the sky really is not falling. Um, we're making good progress. If we think about other forms of inequity and inequality that have um, plagued the United States and other countries, um, those consensus on addressing those forms of inequality uh, has been much more hard fought. In the case of digital equity, what we see is, is there are massive investments being made. I think what the pandemic did is, is it's one of these rare issues in society where there's consensus. Right? It seems like everybody acknowledges that, that digital equity and digital literacy in particular is very important. So we see structural investments being made, right? So, so many states have, have, have really made huge, tremendous strides in expanding access to digital devices, um, uh, improving access to high-speed internet. We see almost a, a cottage industry of digital literacy training programs taking off. I was really surprised um, by the number of, of not you know nonprofits doing this and libraries obviously do this, but there's a lot of non there's a lot of for profit actors who are engaging in this too, um, which which is good and bad. But the bottom line is that there's a lot of interest in this topic, which is great because it's on people's radar. Um, but I think at the same time, just to rehash the initial ground that we, we covered in the beginning, continuing progress means focusing on base hits, not home runs. Right, slow and steady progress. Um, not swinging for the fences every time because then you expend your resources. So we have to be strategic in the way that we invest in addressing digital, the digital divide and, and cultivating digital literacy. Um, and this necessitates improving the body of evidence that we're using to inform resource allocations and, and build our curriculum. What works and what doesn't. And again, you know, I think libraries are a crucial testing ground for, for, for experimentation and such improvements. Um, I think the, the number of digital literacy offerings by, by the libraries in the state of New Jersey are, are tremendous and they're, it's impressive. Um, and, and they're very in tune with what I think communities are, are in need of. So, so really it's, it's just a matter of improving evidence and, and sharing the important lessons that we're learning throughout different libraries in New Jersey and aggregating this knowledge um, to expedite progress. So with that, I think I am just about, well, I'm two a minute and a half short of, of 30 minutes. So I'll stop there. So we do have a question in Q&A, but before I get to that, um, 
I wanted to ask, um, you had mentioned that you had been hoping to share some research or some findings. Um, so I was wondering if you could, if you don't have the findings, but can you share a little bit of your methods and what you're looking at right now and um, you know what your research you're hoping it's gonna show? So we have two things that are, are, are going on. Um, we have a couple of projects. So one of them is essentially trying to map um, academic measures of digital literacy uh, to real world tasks. So if individuals say that they, they're, they're capable of performing X, Y, Z, um, how does that stated capacity relate to their ability to actually do the things that they're saying? And are certain, certain measures, um, stated measures of, of digital literacy, competence, for example, digital skills, um, more predictive of real world capacity or real world performance than others, right? So essentially it's, it's doing some of the things that I was talking about earlier by, by taking existing measures of, um, of digital literacy and seeing how they perform in the wild. Uh, so the second is, is a, a bigger survey of New Jersey residents just trying to assess um, how they felt about uh, their levels of digital their digital literacy, how comfortable they are using technology. Um, I'm not aware, I'm sure it exists, but I'm not aware of any post-pandemic data uh, asking these types of questions. And of course, this is important because, you know, people, you know, we want to see what disparities exist in terms of um, people's perceived self-efficacy as it relates to technology and, and how they see themselves um, able to use technology. That's great, thank you. And um, so we'll have to um, make sure that when you do have everything or you have something ready to be published, um, we'll bring you back so we can get it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's one more I forgot to mention, which is also working with um, minority entrepreneurs in Newark to cultivate digital literacy, um, to improve their access to, to um, government programs. Excellent. Yes, yes, we, um, in this uh, series, we didn't even touch on the business and entrepreneur side, which, um, you know, gets into other areas, but um, yes, there's so many different components to digital literacy and the applications. Um, so I wanna make sure I get to um, Bonnie's uh, question. Um, she asks, who do you think um, or what body should be responsible for determining the measurement for digital literacy for the general public? So uh, not K-12 and not academics. I, I think it's a collaborative effort. Um, I, I think, you know, what I don't think is that, I don't know, I have to be careful with, with, with the names and things, but, you know, what we don't want is another SAT, right, or ACT. Um, I think communities need to play a role in driving measurements. We don't want to be sort of um, overly dogmatic in the way that we think about this. We don't want knowledge to be standardized to the point where it's useless. You know, it, it, it works equally and perfectly for everyone. Um, we want to have more flexible measures. But I, in, in my own opinion, I think that this is a collaborative effort between um, you know, and this this comes from my own you know my own bias, but I think it relate it's a collaborative effort between academics and and in particular libraries, because libraries are at the cutting edge of 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 digital literacy training programs. I mean, there's just so much being done. There's so much data being generated, um, and I think that data could really be leveraged uh, to make tremendous strides in terms of knowledge aggregation and 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 dissemination. So so in my own view, I think academics need to become more active in um, you know, basically, uh, not that we have ivory towers, we work in a public institution, um, but we need to be more active in, in sort of leaving our offices and engaging with, with real world problems. And, and in large part, um, you know, it was just very, very surprised, especially coming over the body of academic research on, on digital literacy measurement. Um, it, there's just no consensus. And, and not only that, they're self-reported measures, so they don't really say much about the real world and real world skills. So I, I think collaborations are essential and, and academics need to do more to partner with, with um, community actors such as libraries to help um, create these measures. Great, thank you. Um, so I think uh, if you don't mind, um, stop uh, discontinuing the sure. share screen. And I'm gonna pull in right before I introduce um, 
Scott and Diane. Um, Mimi and Sharon, did you have any comments or anything that you wanted to um, say in reaction to what Greg shared? Uh, that was a really amazing um, presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, my head is spinning right now with a lot of thoughts going on at the same time. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, what was the information that was presented during the uh, presentation. So thank you so much. Um, had a lot of thought on those um, assessments, uh, evaluations and measures uh, being lacking um, at the current state. Um, so hopefully, we can talk uh, more about that as as we progress into the program, but I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and I would just sort of say the same. I think um, I had, I guess I knew that you know there was no consensus on <laughs> digital literacy measurement among you know different uh, academic you know testing, but I, you know, I, I think yeah, there's definitely a need to to work with other groups to get this more consistent. Um, I mean, schools are doing one thing and, um, you know, th but that doesn't correlate necessarily with what libraries are doing, but I think, yeah, libraries have a big role in, in um, being a part of that. So thank you, because I, I also really enjoyed your presentation. I also wanted to add that, um, that yesterday uh, we uh, had some discussion on the definitions and uh, Dr. Jacobson was mentioning about um, digital literacy um, as a lumped concept, it's not gonna work. It has to be really specific uh, for the group that we are serving and the tasks that they are doing on a daily basis. And that is so um, in line with what I learned um, today. So um, yeah, I'm just very excited about the next hour. <laughs> All right, so, um, and I see that there's conversation going on in the chat, so make sure that you keep putting in your thoughts. Um, it's always interesting to see how you're interacting with the information that's being shared, so thank you. All right, so Scott and Diane, I'm going to introduce you next and we'll get to some of our discussion. Um, Scott Kuczynski is the Director of Literacy Services at the Plainfield Public Library, where he oversees the GED, ESL, Digital Literacy, and General Job Search Training Programs, and serves as liaison to a variety of county, state, and local partners. He holds multiple certificates from the New Jersey Department of Education and is an attorney in good standing in New York and New Jersey. Kuczynski was lead instructor for the New Jersey State Library's Literacy Bootcamp Programs, and is the co-coordinator for the NJSL Plus Partners Hub and Spokes Program. He currently chairs the Union County Workforce Development Board Youth Committee. Prior to his employment at Plainfield Public Library, he taught at every level from middle school to college freshmen. And Diane Sievers um, has been the Deputy Director, Chief Operations Officer for the Workforce Development Board of Middlesex County and Office of Career Opportunity for the past six years, overseeing workforce policy, planning, and daily operations of USDOL and NJDOL workforce granted grant funded programs. Ms. Sievers is a consummate workforce development professional with over 25 years of experience serving in many roles in the workforce, de workforce delivery system and is passionate with helping businesses identify the talent needed and job seekers transition to a career path. Diane is a member of the National Association of Workforce Development Professionals and serves on numerous workforce committees. She is a trustee for the Garden State Employment and Training Association and has chaired the Gasita MIS Pro Committee for the past six years. Additionally, she has been a member on the State Employment and Training Commission's Performance Committee for the past three years. So thank you so much for joining us and Greg for staying on board to talk a little bit more um, from your own experience as well as influenced by maybe the keynote. Um, some questions that uh, you know, we might have lingering in our heads about this topic. So first, um, Greg gave a really good discussion about digital literacy and some of the, the you know, issues with defining that. We talked a little bit about that yesterday. So for you, um, what does the digital skills gap mean for our workforce? Can you define digital literacy in the context of workforce development and job seeker assistance? Um, Scott, I think we'll start with you. Uh, sure. Um, you know, I think I, I actually want to build off of a little bit of what Greg was saying, because it's, it is interesting that we, we have uh, imprecise measurements at this point. And I think particularly what we want to talk about 
or, or where I'm seeing a lot of issues is the difference between, I would almost say fluency versus literacy with it. And just mm -hmm. listen to me, uh, this was gonna sound odd, but we have people who learn platform specific skill sets, but they don't necessarily take that to the point that the skill has been incorporated that they can apply it across platforms. So even where we have people who have an exposure to some form of digital interaction, which you know there's, there's no way not to, um, because there's no longer any forced exposure to a digital backend in the way that you would have had prior to like the really rise of all the graphic user interfaces, they have a hard time transferring the skill set used in a particular user interface to being able to learn a different user interface or to be able to understand what's going on to, to make sort of a intuitive leap as to how something should function. We have a lot of librarians here, so we've all sat there. And how many times have you wanted to say, when they ask you how to do something, you say, well, you see the button that says the thing that you just asked me how to do it? That button, you hit that button. Or uh, I used to joke that I wanted to uh, tell my parents that, that the Google box was actually just how they could text message me. So they should just text the question they have about the computer to me through the Google box. And then I would text, send them back answers on how to fix their computer. So um, I think that we maybe have like degrees of exposure going on, but um, we sort of have issues in teaching the gap of the practical skill. Um, a lot of that does come back to access, to be completely honest. I think there's no way to get around. And when I, I say access, I'm just like, oh, but they have cell phones. They have to, if you're not working on a productivity-based machine, you're not really learning how to function in a digital space. So you may learn how to do the one thing, but you don't learn the other stuff. Or even people who have a computer in a limited access, right? Okay. I'm gonna put a ball in the air. Those of you guys who know me know that I, that I swear this is gonna pay off. I had the opportunity to talk to somebody from Microsoft um, at a wedding. And he had been at Microsoft so long that his email address was literally Bob at Microsoft, okay? And we were talking, and this is when we were first getting into doing digital literacy. I said, Bob, how the heck would you teach this? Because he, you know, uh, because, and I said the same thing, I'm finding, that we can maybe teach a limited task, but they don't have the fluency to go outside that task or to acquire new skills. And he said, how did you learn how to do computer stuff? And I said, I don't know. We just had to know how to do it because it was the 80s and we had to, you know, make our own computers. And, uh, you know, we were talking about rewriting our config sys and auto exec files to uh, reallocate RAM because I wanted to play computer games and you had to do that. It said, exactly. We went in and we weren't learning a skill, we were figuring out how to make a task happen. And he said, if, if he could design a digital literacy program, I still think it's the best thing ever and it'll never happen. He would have a computer lab closed off from the rest of the world and he would go in and just break random things every day and then say, hey guys, don't worry, we're gonna reset the machines. Your job is to figure out how to fix this stuff today. You're not gonna break anything because how, many, how often when, when we have to troubleshoot a problem on somebody's computer, you know, we all have people who work they could probably figure out, but they're too terrified to try to fix it on their own because they think if they try to fix it on their own, there's a button that will make the computer explode, right? So getting them to the ability that they can acquire a skill or that they can acquire knowledge by understanding that the, the method for doing it is also this computer and to be able to tra create transferable skill sets is I think where we don't have a good measurement yet. We don't have a good way to do that. We have a lot of product specific training. We have a lot of that, but I, I think we, we lag in developing fluency. And I think it may be because that's just always the hardest thing to develop. Anyway, sorry, I went very off topic, but that surprised no one who knows me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Don't worry. I went into it knowing I have questions, but well, this is organic. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> No, and you bring up some really good points. Um, Irene was saying in chat, um, agreeing with you, but also bringing up that it might be a capacity issue that the person doesn't have time to make those leaps or might be afraid, which is basically what you said. So Diane, um, how about for you? Um, what does digital literacy mean to you in the context of workforce development? So <clears throat> I definitely agree with everything uh, Scott and Greg have um, laid out thus far. So when we think about the digital divide, the image that 
comes to mind most is individuals that don't have access to computers and devices and of people in communities that have limited access to the internet. So you know, the digital divide, you know, to me refers to the gulf between people who have, who have access to digital, digital skills and those who don't. Um, access to digital skills refers to the foundational digital training that arms people with knowledge to use current technologies to respond to technological changes. So when we're looking at access to occupational specific skills, uh, it allows people to adapt and advance in their careers and in industry. When we talk about workforce development, to me, everything is about careers and in industry, mm -hmm. um, meaning access to reskilling, training, um, training allowing workers to move from one industry to another in specific structural shifts mm -hmm. in the labor market, especially um, like those brought about by the pandemic. Um, yeah. As leaders and communities, we're adapting to the change with the COVID-19. Um, many have turned to virtual tools overnight. Um, so employers, you know, as we're speaking with employers, um, having employees work, you know, during the pandemic, having employees shifting everything to work remotely, restaurants and grocery stores mm -hmm. to offering online delivery options, classes being taught online, of course, telehealth becoming a reality, uh, as Greg, um, you know, started off his presentation and everyone Zooming. Um, you know, I don't think I zoomed before the before the pandemic. Um, so these options, unfortunately, are not available to all. And, and as I'm seeing for the customers that uh, that we serve here at our career center and our one stop, um, you know, utilizing telehealth or taking classes online, people need digital access. So, you know, even before the pandemic, workers uh, lack the tech, the foundational digital skills needed uh, to adapt quickly and upskill their jobs. Um, I read uh, somewhere that the, and this is an old stat, because um, I, 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 I love stats, Greg, so <laughs> I'm always looking at stats and numbers, but as the Federal uh, Communication Commission's report back in 2019, they had a broadband deployment report mm -hmm. that indicated that 21.3 uh, million Americans didn't have access to wire, wired or wire, uh, wireless broadband yeah. internet. Um, but as of 2020, there's uh, an independent research company called Broadband Now um, that's studying access to internet technologies. Estimated that actual number of U.S. Americans without high-speed internet mm -hmm. is twice that amount. So that's staggering when you think about it from a, um, a national standpoint. Um, it, it, it indicated, Broadband Now indicated that they estimated that nationally 34 million Americans lack access to broadband uh, of at least 25 megabytes per second. Uh, download yeah. speeds. So that, you know, when I'm looking at uh, from a national perspective, not only from New Jersey's perspective, um, hearing 34 million Americans lacking, and then of course mm -hmm. with the uh, di the uh, digital equity uh, issue, you know, that it, it's staggering. Um, furthermore, like the digitalization, um, I, I did have my coffee, but sometimes my words, <laughs> uh, the digitalization of our workforce has changed the nature of skills that jobs require. So when we're looking at increasing technological nature of jobs, uh, that means digital skills are necessary for workers to thrive in the modern workplace. That healthcare and manufacturing, I can't tell you the countless conversations that uh, I've had with different industries in need uh, to hire middle skilled positions. Yeah. Now, you know, what I'm finding is the definition of middle skilled positions vary. <laughs> so <laughs> to some, it's people that require at least a high school, but less than a four year degree. And to others, it's, it's uh, at least a bachelor's degree. Okay. So, you know, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought the importance of digital skills uh, to, for workers in virtually every industry and occupation throughout our country, business workers, students, parents, have been scrambling to adapt a new reality uh, where, para, um, where uh, paramedics are triaging uh, patients via telehealth technology, retail workers are utilizing customized app to process inventory. And of course, educators are moving their classes. They have moved all their classes online. Mm -hmm. So when we, you had mentioned, uh, you know, defining digital literacy in the context of workforce development and job seeker assistance, um, in workforce development, job seekers are util utilizing the internet for job searches, and they have to. There's no way around that at this point. Uh, and communication with, and also communication with potential employers. Interviews are now conducted mostly online and, and virtual. Um, and then, you know, several research uh, studies have shown that digital divide is more than just an access issue. Definitely, access is the forefront um, that we need to combat. But individuals need to know how much. Uh, 
to make to make use of the information and tech and communication tools. Mm -hmm. So you know, job search and applications are all taking uh, place online uh, or on computers. Online tool, as we're discussing job seekers, online tools are now the most important resource for many job seekers, uh, and many searches uh, for jobs on their mobile device. Um, and then also, you know, assessments used by community colleges or online occupational training and education um you know even locally here we've we've since the pandemic uh we we have moved all of our programs virtually online overnight so uh literally within a two-week period of time um you know the internet information portals uh, you know all of this requires online at this point so going back to workforce you know entry-level and middle-skilled jobs um, again, increasingly requiring digital skills, not having these skills are, are holding workers back. Um, many, many jobs, of, of course, are requiring foundational digital literacy skills. Um, another study that employer uh, that I, I read of an employer job posting found that 78% of middle skilled jobs uh, require baseline digital, digital skills. Uh, so that's pretty staggering when you think about it. Um, and, the, and the study further defined digital skills as being able to work with spreadsheets and word processing software, as Greg had mentioned, um, thank, you know, very, very true. So that's just the very baseline. Um, and then with the advent of technology, you know, looking, um, speaking with employers and, and businesses and looking at the different industries with artificial intelligence and where we're going for, we're, we're training people. Number one, we're trying to identify jobs of the future. Um, but with the, the advancement of technology, it's becoming more important than ever to have the needed digital skills to not only find employment, but retain it. Um, employers, for instance, in advanced manufacturing companies are, are requiring uh, skills to operate their computerized machinery. So that's, again, to you know what Greg had mentioned, that's much more than just basic uh, digital skills. Uh, we had done uh, locally here in our one stop back about four, three and a half years ago, we did an incumbent worker training contract. Uh, to train, uh, we met with Sunny Delight here in South Brunswick, and we, you know, we toured their facility a few years back and noticed that everyone, I, I, I had a perception uh, that was completely false. I expected to see a lot of people, on the, <laughs> and what I saw were a lot of machines operated by people, and uh, by few people. Um, you know, their whole entire facility at that time, this is back in uh, early 2018, only had uh, approximately 98 people at that time for two shifts. And that's pretty, and that's including the, you know, the accountant, the bookkeepers and everything. That's pretty staggering when you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, but all of their, you know, all of their, their, the individuals that were working were operating technical skills and not just basic digital, uh, digital skills necessary to do their job. Um, we provided the entire company, um, Sunny Delight, with incumbent worker training in Six Sigma Lean Management, from white belt to true blue belt, all different levels, depending on um, their particular skill sets, you know, from the person answering the phone, the receptionist, to the person working on the floor to increase their efficiency. So, you know, digital literacy, you know, is, is an important, even where employers provide specific digital tasks, systems. Um, and then, you know, many workers and job seekers are, are lacking these foundational digital skills needed by employers, as we discussed. Uh, closing the gap requires digital training. Um, I, I, I do, I completely agree with Greg that, you know, measuring this is, is, is very difficult. Um, just identifying, you know, and, and trying to get a handle on how we can help individuals that are walking through the door here at our, you know, not at this point we're, we're, we're open, but we're still managing a lot of people virtually. Um, in short, you know, the, the pandemic accelerated 10 years of planned technological change in workforces in less than one year. I read that and that, that stuck with me um, mm -hmm. because we don't have a comprehensive policy or strategy to help workers build digital skills throughout their careers. Um, the pandemic demonstrated the urgency of putting high quality uh, connected technology in more hands. Uh, and it also demonstrated that we, uh, we won't close the digital divide or, or realize our nation's economic potential until we empower all workers to adapt uh, to the technological constant evolution in the workplace. So that's just a little bit about my, my thoughts. Excellent, thank you. Um, and I'm also thinking about a study that I read about um, called the demographic drought and it's about the shifting 
um, demographics and how that's going to affect workforce. And that those middle skills, you know, the people who are not in the workforce, but maybe they could be, and you know, how much of that is not having the skills and not knowing how to acquire the skills or, you know, not being connected to the appropriate jobs. So, um, you know, definitely looking at that area as a, a place to, to focus because the people, you know, sometimes um, maybe we're targeting people or having people come in who aren't in that, that critical place where they could most benefit from the digital literacy uh, services, um, you know, that, that middle area. Um, uh, so Greg, did you have anything to add here? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think um, the, it's, I, I don't have much to add. I mean, I think these are important points. Um, I, I think really the, I mean, the, the idea of, of, of fluency is the distinction, first of all, between digital literacy and digital fluency, I think is, is a good one. And, and the idea of, of, of being able to sort of take abstract principles and apply them to different settings is, is, I mean, it's super important. It's also really, really, I think it's really challenging. Um, I think a lot of folks have difficulty doing that. And of course the, the implication then is that, uh, you know, in the context of workforce mobility, those who are able to do this, who have an easier time doing this might have more career opportunities available to them. Whereas those who, who are less able to do that, right? Like we can call it um, digital, digital, um, ambidextrity, ambide ambidexterity, right? Um, so, you know, those who are who, who are having a more difficult time um, are obviously stuck into careers where where they're unable to really shift and, and do much. So, I, I think it's an interesting conversation in general, and and the role of of not just access to to technology and internet connections or being able to use technology, but but applying them across different domains is is, is yet another important issue. Yeah. And that's in line with um, the observations in libraries. I see Jennifer saying in chat that um, people use a computer at work every day, but then they still need help with other tasks. So it's that transition I, between programs or applications. <laughs> Not to put the, the uh, former teacher hat on, but really in a sense is everybody, because we're all at least academic or academic adjacent familiar with uh, essentially what was Bloom's taxonomy, which was used forever to talk about levels of understanding. And when we can get them to essentially, uh, like Greg was saying, that to take the abstraction of the idea and apply it into a different thing, that's what we're talking about would be the highest level of knowledge, or I forgot what they call it now under webs, which is I think the new thing they're using. Uh, that is when we, we've moved from essentially the uh, giving fish to fishing, right? Um, I would even say, so there was a lot of talk about testing and measurement, and I'm going to be the bad guy who actually likes tests. I like tests and measurements and standardization. I think we do a very bad job of knowing what that test is actually saying and what to do with it. It's not necessarily the, the tool in and of itself, but what did it actually show us and how should that inform what we're doing? So for example, um, you know, Greg mentioned the SATs a, a, a lot. I think the SATs do a pretty good job at doing a particular thing, just not what we think that it does. <laughs> so for example, there was a, a, a large article in the Atlantic a few days ago about, yeah, but what, if we had a test that actually showed sort of an equity amongst all the people taking it, um, ir regardless of what their opportunity had been, then it's not actually measuring what we have, which is that all the things leading up to the SAT are really what it are determining that inequality. And we wanna have a measurement that there is that inequality. So the SAT showing that is not a problem, but that we use it to be so uh, deterministic of future things is problematic. But if the SAT shows us that there was an inequality of opportunity through K through 12, actually kind of tells you, yeah, it's probably a good measure of that. So how do we allow that to inform our policy and actually addressing the inequalities underneath it. Now, how does that attach this uh, digital literacy thing? I, I have to uh, agree with something that, that Greg was saying is that, yeah, you, you'd think there would be something at this point. I mean, you have the PAC does do some, uh, we kind of just, um, those of you guys who've worked with me know that I tend to be a little bit of a bulldozer. It's, we're sort of like, screw it. We just picked a test and went with it. So we've been uh, 
and particularly we found there was a lack of measurement was at the the lower and broader side of digital literacy. So, you know, when you had very esoteric, very um, vendor specific certifications, right? Like uh, I always tell people back in the day, you know, the only certificates that existed were like, so I can make a computer with pocket lint and, uh, you know, a chop saw. Like it were really, if you had a certificate, you were like the, uh, the position that doesn't exist anymore, but we all remember in the 80s and 90s, you could just be, oh, I'm a computer guy. And I was like, oh, we know what that means. Uh, and so we've been using, I don't want to sound like I'm like shilling here, but I just want to talk about it in terms of this. We've been using the IC3 exam through CertiCorp. Um, I know that's gotten a lot of traction. We've actually had a lot of luck with Department of Labor um, actually has allowed us um, under workforce learning link funds to use that in place of essentially where we were where we were going to be providing service to people. And when you had to get them, you know, certified to for the workforce learning, like there was a CASAS test that was, or TABE, now CASAS, they had to be evaluated with something prior to service. We were like, but that test has nothing to do with, we're going to give the digital literacy training. So we actually have been using uh, the lowest tier of IC3 as the digital literacy assessment. And we've sort of had to develop in-house because it doesn't exist. Um, what various scores uh, mean tiering wise for the type of training that we'd be uh, doing. So actually this is uh, Diane's here. We've actually done this with uh, both Union County and we used to come down to your uh, AJCs to recruit people during orientation uh, for it. And we wanna start doing that again when people are back in because we <laughs> recruitment is, is, is clutch. But we're, um, so we've been really, uh, uh, pushing to sort of go with that. I, do I think it's the greatest test in the world? No. Do I think if we don't put too much weight on it and we don't expect that the differences between stay nines to be so, oh, well, this person got 10 points more than that person. They must be an expert in this and it's out of a thousand points scale. As long as we understand that it's showing us broad strokes of general understanding, we found it to be fairly, fairly good. Just, you know, again, you have to understand the, the limits of, of, of your, your tool set. Like um, one of our IT guys and I took the test when they first, uh, when we first were doing it to get a sense of it. And we had like, ah, oh, this question. And then at the end I said, Roderick, if somebody passed that test, do you think that you would feel comfortable hiring them to do general office work? He goes, oh yeah. I was like, that's all the test needs to do. Mm -hmm. And so we've really been working with uh, particularly our county workforce development board. And as I said, we did work with Middlesex on this until the pandemic and hopefully we'll, we'll start up again on that uh, to do uh, that. This is a skill set that should almost be happening at the start of when someone has entered the, the training portion of unemployment, as opposed to be sort of like a, a specialization at the end of it, because wherever we're going to send them for secondary training, right? Any of those industry and demand things or anything where they would be tapping ITA to go to something if they don't know how to do the computer stuff, they're not gonna be able to uh, do any sort of specialized training anyway, right? So catching them up front, like, hey, the, we wanna, we wanna um, measure your digital literacy almost the same way we do, again, reading and math through CASAs or TABE, that this tells us the sort of a foundational skill set as we're looking to fit you back into the workforce. So I know that Union County has been really, uh, big on pushing this with us um, as well and, and looking to expand that. I think it, it has to be treated that that same way, that it is a foundational skill set because that's how you acquire the other skills. Mm -hmm. um, there was something when uh, the, not, I'm going to say HSE, but I may sub in GED because, you know, Kleenex versus tissues. But when we had the, uh, uh, the change in 2014, the last edition of um, HSE came out and that was GD came out in New Jersey and I was uh, down with department ed there because we're um, a GD site as well, so I'm our chief examiner. And there was a lot of pushback because um, a change from the 2002 series to the uh, 2014 series was that the GED could, was only going to be delivered electronically. There was no uh, uh, pen and paper option. And people were like, oh my God, you know, this is an access thing. And that's a legitimate point. And uh, the department of ed, said at this meeting, and I, I, I thought they're right, they're like, it is the position of the Department of Ed that if this is, you know, measuring uh, what a high schooler should know, the basic digital competency to be able to take this test online is part of it. If they can't take it in a digital format, 
then yeah, we don't want to issue them a state issued diploma. Um, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that was it. So I think more and more we're seeing a shift of it from being a specialized skill, like I work with computers to being, right. it's a foundational. Um, right. So and I think that this is a good segue and if it's not, I'm gonna make it fit. <laughs> Um, but you have been kind of touching on this, that it does seem like there's, you know, like two things going on that, you know, we have, um, this is for individual job seekers and um, people advancing in their careers, as well as the larger, you know, what we're doing in workforce development, that you have these immediate needs, mm -hmm. um, things that need to be addressed right now, but then the things that we're looking for in the future. So we have COVID has really exacerbated a lot of these issues and we're trying to get people back to work who maybe had issues because of COVID or you know, they need to transition their skill set right now. But then we're also looking ahead for the, these larger trends and the impact of federal investments looking at digital equity and you know, what may be coming down the line. So in your minds, um, what are some of those main issues for right now? And then what are some of those longer trends that you're, you're keeping an eye on and thinking that might be worth exploring you know, with that longer reach? Uh, you know, easy question. So, so <laughs> I mean, I have two that we've been kind of dealing with them. One, um, so, uh, there's been a big push for, oh, you know, what did we learn from the pandemic was we can do remote stuff, we can do digital stuff for training, and do doesn't mean efficacious, particularly with what we're targeting, and I've been bouncing around government stuff long enough to know that people are going to look at price tags, um, and frankly, it, it is more cost effective, not effective to do a lot of these. We've off shifted service to remote. We can be geographically decentralized if we're remote. We can um, essentially, you know, uh, serve with no cap if we're remote, but not understanding that. And, you know, uh, Greg, you'd be able to probably speak to this better than me because I'm, you know, the research field. But uh, the last that I remember seeing in, in the educational research on it was that any of these massive online things, or once we talk about self-directed, not hybridized, but like minus support self-directed or, or massive online is, unless people already kind of had foundational skill sets in that area, they were incredibly ineffective. You know, um, like the, the story about one of the first big ones that was launched was the MIT robotics course that they offered as one of the first uh, MOOCs, massive online. And I think it was something like, the only people who completed it already had a degree in engineering, you know? So I, I think that particularly in a workforce development format where we're targeting clients who, you know, if they're coming to us for that retraining, there's a very good chance they don't have the ability to access that training on their own. They don't have the ability to do that, you know? So if we're saying there's some sort of um, underlying issues with their ability to acquire these skill sets, then to ask them to do it with even less support, I think is going to be problematic. So I'm really concerned about both the push from a policy side to see significantly more implementation of remote or self-directed options versus in-person. Um, like, you know, I was at a place where they, they, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus, but one of our, one of the workforce things, somebody was very, like 11,000 people signed up for this online skills training program that we've offered. I was like, wow, that's a huge number. And it was used for 11,000 hours. Now I can do math. That's not good, right? So I think we have to deal with that portion, but also um, something that I've said a few times, we talked about, uh, Greg talked about teacher evaluation. My personal belief is that we shouldn't do teacher evaluations until somebody's been out of their class for five years. Um, because I think we all know uh, the way you remember a teacher immediately after you've had that class versus five years from there is certainly informed by um, almost removing a lot of those factors Greg was talking about. You know, how nice were they? How easy was the class versus did I learn something there? Did I get something out of it? Because we, we're all probably thinking of that elementary or middle or high school teacher. They're like, yeah, well, 10 years later, I realized they were the best teacher I ever had. And I think we see a lot of people now where the convenience or the ease of accessibility for remote is working against them wanting to return to uh, 
in-person service for, for populations that do. And I, and I don't want to say that I'm saying, oh, they're just sitting at home, it's easier. Listen, if you have somebody who's may possibly be an incumbent worker, they're working full time, they have kids. I understand them going, yeah, but this is so much easier if I can take it at night. So it's, it's I'm not, you know, doing the whole bootstrapping thing. I'm just saying, if we have people who are in a difficult situation, which is tends to be what drives people to training, right? Like they're not like, my life's great. I'm going to go pick up some new skills. That doesn't happen. Um, yeah, and if Gabby were here, I know that she would be saying that um, with the Access Navigator program, because it's one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. at the point of need, you know, that kind of service is more expensive, but yeah. more effective for those individuals who, like you were saying, if they yeah. were, if their issue is technology-driven and they're pointed to technology, mm -hmm. then they're not going to really get the, the result yeah. that they want. And not to, I'm going to try to make this quick, but I totally agree. The, the other issue that we're really seeing, and I do not know how this is going to shake out, and it's a fairly new thing, is um, it, not technically the minimum wage because we know where it is, but that because of certain changes in the workforce right now, the, the entry level for what we, I hate to use the term, unskilled labor versus the entry level for skilled labor right now, where there used to be a, a, a much more significant gap just isn't there because if we have like Amazon is hiring at 22 an hour, right? With a $3,000 signing bonus. Um, one of those factors, and again, I'm not shaming anyone on this. I understand if you have to make a decision about supporting your family, it's a little bit more difficult while, you know, whatever the unemployment rates are like three something, even adjusting for all of the stuff we usually get, like who's dropped out of the workforce, et cetera. Plus, starting wages in unskilled labor are so high compared to the starting um, wages and I guess we would call those middle skilled jobs currently, they haven't seen that bump. I think we've seen, and I can say particularly in our recruitment efforts, a real downturn in, in interest in these trainings because you know when the motivation was before, essentially that you would see really almost an immediate jump by being able to move from entry level um, Amazon warehouse to I'm doing data entry somewhere or I'm doing office work somewhere or I think and again it's it's a much harder pitch particularly for like an intensive course as opposed to like oh show up one night and we'll show you how to cut and paste in word I think it's a lot harder to get people out for it and it, it's not going to last it's an artificial uh bump at this point and whether it's going to be that things come back down to, you know, the, the state mandated minimum wage, I don't think so. Things don't tend to go that way. Or we're going to see that the the bump translates across um, as, you know, the middle skill workers start to be able to demand more. I don't know. But once that gap reoccurs, I think we'll be we'll see people wanting to having the that it makes more sense for them to come to this sort of training because the, the gains will be more immediate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm talking about it very carefully. No, no. Yeah. And because um, even yesterday, I think that there was some discussion about the number of people coming in may not be as high for these trainings, but you're raising a good point that not using what the numbers are now to influence how you're going to plan for the future because things will change. So uh, Diane, I want to bring you in here because I see you nodding along. So what's I'm your thought on this? Well, I'm I'm right there with Scott. You know, I think uh, we, we have a huge issue with uh, digital access here. And, um, you know, we, one of the things that I, I'm an example that comes to mind is we run a young adult or youth program um, for out of school youth between 16 to 24 years old. And what I found was that during the pandemic over the past two years, um, these, you know, we, we always have barriers to employment set or barriers to get people to training programs or HSE programs that we run. Um, so we, we've seen increased participation and increased success actually with our, our young adult program uh, where with our, our adults that, you know, we're serving a lot of people, but we're not serving the people that are most in need, I'm finding. I'm finding that, you know, we, we've, during the pandemic, we, we had to meet people in parking lots, um, you know, in their, you know, across from their cars. We've done whatever we could for those individuals that didn't have, don't have access, especially our senior population or, our, you know, I'm gonna say more, you know, over 45, 50, and that's not really senior, but our older population um, has really been experiencing 
difficulty um, accessing you know, our services in essence because we went virtual overnight. Uh, we moved everything from in-person services to um, you know, creating Zoom services, making uh, all of our documentation through um, a DocuSign and so forth. So, you know, some of the main issues that that we're we're seeing here locally, um, you know, number one is that broadband service. Not, you know, a number of people may even have access to a laptop, but they still don't have access to broadband. So, you know, one of the um, one of the endeavors that we're working on is we are we have been working with our libraries. Uh, we're trying to create, even pre-pandemic, we had discussed creating something called, um, uh, well, I'm just losing my train of thought for a moment, but but working with our libraries, creating skill up connection sites with our lo local libraries in Middlesex County um, that, will, that we can help with uh, possibly uh, lending out laptops uh, for individuals that are a part of our, some of our programs. Specifically, we, we run um, programs for people on public assistance, um, you know, that have limited or no work experience in some cases. So offering them, uh, a, you know, the libraries, what, what you guys do so great is lending out uh, equipment and uh, books, of course, but I, I think one of the things that we, what we've been doing and we're always applying for additional grants is uh, to receive laptops to help individuals with broadband built in um, so that that's one barrier that we can try to address, at least locally. Um, will it help everyone? No, but we're, 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 we're trying to break down the barriers one step at a time. I think the challenges faced by low-income and under-invested communities, you know, existed pre-COVID and, and definitely still exist today. Um, you know, and, and then at a state level, I think legislation is beginning to, you know, expanding to access broadband. Um, by deploying funding uh, to, you know, fund projects for broadband and re for uh, residential areas that are without. So, you know, one of the, um, with Middlesex County, they have a destination 2040 plan, a master plan for over a 20 year period. And one of the areas that's highlighted in their plan is access to broadband services uh, to all residents. Uh, and, and that's paramount, I think, in, in a lot of ways, at least from, from, the customers that are walking through our door, not walking, but physically <laughs> reaching out to us uh, virtually, um, many of them do not have access. So, you know, some of the people that are attending our virtual workshops are, are using utilizing their mobile devices, which, you know, uh, we, we can help. We're going to be helping them through this laptop uh, loaner program and working with our libraries locally. We've reached out to about 10 libraries in Middlesex County to become a uh, skill up connection site, South Brunswick being one. So thank you, Jill. I know you're on this call, on this meeting. Um, and, you know, working with uh, other libraries to expand our services and, and sort of, you know, if they can't come to our one stop, they can come to the, their, their local libraries. So we want to provide some of our one stop services. We are, we're seeking additional funding with the American Recovery Act. We've re uh, requested funding so that we can access, you know, uh, provide signage and some, with our grant funds, we're not able to use anything for marketing. So that, that really puts a hindrance on, um, you know, providing some signage and some kiosks possibly at the libraries. Um, so we're always, you know, we're always working with the libraries for that. Um, so, you know, additionally, uh, the national, there's, um, the National Skills uh, Coalition has uh, skills state policy and advocacy network. So they call it skills span uh, coalitions that are working to advance policies that increase digital equity at the state level. So some of their, when I, when I was looking through some articles a while back, um, I think it was last September, one came, came to me and it was called the um, National Skills um, Coalition launched a digital equity at work campaign. Uh, and they developed five principles that, that, they're saying guide policymakers um, to close the digital divide and support digital equity. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on this. Basically high quality hardware, everything we're talking about, high quality hardware in all hands, uh, every community connected, which is huge. Uh, and again, this is part of our uh, Middlesex County Destination 2040 master plan. Um, digital skill foundation for all. So uh, ensuring every, every person must, you know, having the opportunity to develop broad-based, uh, broad flexible digital problem-solving problem skills uh, for current technologies and ongoing technological shifts. And then, you know, upskilling every worker in every workplace. Uh, so, you know, we, you know, empowering every worker with industry and occupational specific digital skills to adapt and advance in their careers. 
And then lastly, uh, and, and this is again, speaking to what we've been talking about, rapid reskilling uh, for reemployment. So um, reminding you that every worker must have access to rapid reskilling uh, training uh, to move from one industry to another. So those are just some insights that I see of main issues and hopefully some trends that'll be moving forward. Great, thank you so much. There's so much there. I tried to put in links into the chat, but if you have anything else to add, make sure you add it in. Um, and Greg, do you see any um, short-term right now issues with digital equity, digital literacy that we should be looking at in addition to um, the longer term? I loved how you talked about looking at base hits versus home runs, but do you have anything else that you're kind of seeing to keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, so I think today or to, to this point in the conversation, we've really been focusing on um, measures to improve digital literacy. Uh, but I, I think at the other at the under at the other end or or from the other perspective, we also need to be thinking about ways of of simplifying things, right? Like if you look at um, state websites, um, New Jersey isn't bad, and I, I've heard um, that, for example, the EDA, the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, partnered with the New Jersey Office of Innovation to to really simplify um, access to 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 applications. There are screening tools now that are becoming more prevalent, and things like that. So, but but these measures are are, are essential, right? Like just making interacting with government more simple, less burdensome um, through technology is 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 as important as empowering the public through digital, digital literacy enhancing interventions. So I guess what I'm saying is that while much of the onus is on the individual to engage with opportunities to improve um, their digital literacy, to, to do a better job of representing their interests, um, I think governments also need to be aware of how their interactions and their outreach might be overly cumbersome. Um, and find ways of streamlining that, right? Like we can, we can interacting with the private sector. It's very easy, you know. They're they're begging us to take our money, and it's 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 very very easy to do these things. Um, should be easier to pay bills, right? Um, but it's it's not. So so I think I think these changes need to come from both ends, not just from the state's perspective, not just from the individual or or the user, but also from the state provider perspective. That's definitely a great point that um, we it, the issue isn't always that we have to raise people up to our level. Sometimes we need to lower the barriers and see things from, I mean, we always talk about walking into like, even just the very simple thing of like, how do you walk into your building? If you come in through the staff entrance and you're missing what people are seeing when they come in as a patron. So you can look at that in so many different ways from your digital presence and you know, how are people interacting, you know, I'm looking at it from just even that basic level of looking at your own library services as a patron, um, in addition to the more uh, systemic, larger policy things that could change in government and elsewhere. So that's a great point as well. Um, it looks like we're running a little bit lower on um, time before we get to the Q&A from the audience, although I'm not seeing so many things coming into the chat, so we might be able to bleed our time in a little bit. But if you do have questions for Scott, Diane, or Greg, um, make sure that you're putting them into the chat or the Q&A now, because we'll be getting to those in a few minutes. So get those burning questions in. Um, but I wanted to ask now a little bit about success stories. So. Um, here, maybe we'll take out the, um, although I think we can learn from failures too. So we're talking about digital literacy and workforce development and, and upscaling and all of these things. What are you seeing as some promising approaches? What are some success stories that you're seeing? And then how about we also talk about some failures or some things that maybe have been tried even pre-pandemic that were total flops that, you know, are, are really things that we can learn from and, and maybe do the opposite or do it differently. Um, Scott, I'll start with you again, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. And um, I know we're on a, a clock, so feel free to just mute me when you've had enough. Um, I, I think at this point, I kind of touched on a little bit, but I know what we're personally uh, struggling with is how do we craft a course that is both intense enough to sort of build these foundational skills, but uh, 
something that we're going to be able to get people to buy into, like where we saw our biggest increase in client retention and success. And, and I mean, both in passing our certifications, but, you know, moving on to jobs and moving on to whatever was actually when we were really connected to doing, you know, 20 hours a week and we were able to satisfy people's ABT requirements, we were able to satisfy their, their training and, and work search things so that when people who were unemployed could commit to doing our training as their job, we saw a really significant improvement and we seem to be moving at least uh, away from that in terms of the client flow we're getting. But, you know, we hit a point where, um, I've, I've said this a lot to our, our hubs and spokes, is that if your service serves everyone and tries to serve everyone, you're unfortunately probably not serving everyone terribly well. Um, and so, you know, you do need a degree of sufficiency. And I just don't think digital literacy tends to lend itself to one-offs or one-room schoolhouse approach. I mean, anybody who's ever run a, hey, we're gonna do a class on Word, it's a, it's a, it's a one-day workshop. And like, somebody's like, cool, I can finally learn how to do macros. And somebody's like, so Word, that's what the W on my computer meant, you know? And uh, we're not gonna be able to keep them, them in the same room. And it's something that I think any of our sort of non-traditional service providers, we're trying to become traditional service providers have to remember, um, like I was just talking about this yesterday, um, you all went through a lot of formal school and think about your, that, that's a lot of gates that were between each level to try to keep everyone sort of together. You had 12 grades, you know, you had honors classes within that, you had basic classes within that or whatever they're, they're doing now because we can't, um, you know, track. But even within that, did you look around this room, the, the 20 people that they were like, these guys are all sort of together and go, yeah, we are definitely all the same level. You didn't. So now when we're dealing with adults and we're talking about the broadness of this, um, I just feel like you need both significantly better tiering of programming and, and intensity of programming, but where we're also dealing with an adult workforce, the, getting it to fit um, so that they can attend it is problematic. So we're really, um, I think we found things that, that work well if I have all the time and all the commitment in the world from people. Um, and, you know, as I was sort of talking about earlier, um, you know, because we, we really do have pretty good numbers when we were able to have people who were in, treating their training as their job as they moved to something else during unemployment. We really feel like we had something that works there. And we're just, as we're having to repackage it now, I think we're, we're, we're finding issues with that. I mean, just alone, it's the stupid old joke, you know, like the, the tape that came with your VCR about how to operate your VCR. I mean, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we have to switch the class to remote. We were definitely found that we were talking about a 60% rate of what we were able to cover under the other one. We had had to take the three IC3 certs to make up the core of it and break it down over uh, two different courses. Anyway, I'm rambling. I'm going to stop. <laughs> I see people nodding. Yes, yes, um, definitely. You know, the the working within the constraints of the attendees, uh, knowing what you know, if you had all that time, if you had them right in front of you, how you could do it and then having to adapt, that's such an issue. And then as we had talked about, you know, learning how to use a computer by using a computer. So Diane, um, what do you think are some of the successes and maybe some of the, the learning experiences? Uh, I definitely uh, can relate to what Scott's saying, um, you know, as I mentioned a few moments earlier, some of one of once it's it's easier to talk about what's not working sometimes, um, or what's not a success. But our our youth program now operates both, uh, you know, for as a for instance, we have an HSE program through our community college through Middlesex College. Um, it's now both for you know online and in person. So we we we're giving our young adults the option that you know for those that lack their high school equivalency the option to do either online or remote, um, I'm, I'm sorry, online or in person. So that that has been uh, very successful, I think, um, because there are still many people that would prefer in person um, versus online, and not only because of the, the, uh, the lack of access. Um, some of the, one other, you know, prior to, prior to the pandemic, we, uh, in Middlesex County, we, we, we really took a, a hard look at, you know, what services we are providing uh, and how we can 
how we can provide more access to the masses of people that are unemployed rather than just limited access to those that are just um, coming in for what, you know, training services, for instance, um, and are determined eligible for our federal funding. So we, we you know, we launched Skill Up Middlesex, uh, and that's a online learning platform that offers more than 6,000 courses, both from a soft skill, you know, soft skills to hard skills, um, everything from you know leadership development to uh, Word, Word, Cisco, uh, project management, industry recognized programs and certifications. So we launched this back in uh, Fe February of 2018 successfully, and um, the state has now the state has now you know during the pandemic around uh, June of 2020, I, I got a call from some leaders at the Department of Labor, and they've identified you know you guys have been using this uh, metrics learning. Um, platform that you marketed as Skill Up Middlesex, and we'd like to know more about it. So they put me in touch with all their uh, IT folks for months uh, to talk about some of the pitfalls, some, what's good, what's working, what's not. And the state had since launched, so the state has since launched now, as of last March, March of 21, a uh, Skill Up New Jersey, for I'm sure most of you might be aware of it. Um, and it, it's really, so that's that's a success in, in the sense that, you know, we're able to provide technical training, um, and what we did with Skill Up Middlesex is we, we created a no eligibility criteria. I, one of the things that I wanted to look at in um, providing services back in 2016, when I started looking at numbers of people walking through the door, there was about 10,000 people between our Perth Amboy and New Brunswick One Stop Career Centers that had accessed some of our services. And out of the 10,000, about 450 received individual training grants, occupational skills training grants. So that became the impetus for me to look at how can we provide um, broader services across without having to require eligibility. So, um, you know, we've launched Skill Up Middlesex to every county resident in Middlesex County to access free of charge 6,000 courses for a period of a six month time frame, and they can renew their, their license for up to a year. So, you know, um, that's a success, but when I say a success, we're what we're talking about today is, that still leaves out, you know, this is for the intermediate user. Um, we're still missing that huge, that huge slice of pie where we're, you know, we really need to find uh, a lot more to be, to be able to help those individuals uh, that have no access or limited access, or uh, I've never turned on a computer. I don't know how to do a job search. And so we have built uh, an in-house program. We've developed an in-house program to help our customers. Um, specifically, we have programs to help all walks of life, but one of our populations are people on public assistance. And we, it, right now it's, it's online. We are moving to hybrid. Um, because and and as such, uh, you know, we've been applying for different grants for laptops to help them so that they can take home the laptops, have access to um, Wi-Fi, and be able to access if they can't come here because they have childcare issues or they have transportation issues. Outside of the digital issues, we also have all of the other barriers that come along with it. So. Um, just to talk about our successes, I mean, I think Skill Up Middlesex, um, our online learning platform has been very successful. Uh, you know, over the pandemic, we had over a thousand people um, uh, register with more than 20,000 programs started um, over an eight month time frame. You know, but again, I, I do feel that there is much uh, work to be done to help those that um, do not have access and have limited skills. Excellent, thank you. And Greg, do you have any um, best practices or anything from your research that really stood out as uh, something that you took notice of? It's it's still early stages, so so not really. I mean, we as an academic, I guess I spend all my day talking about problems, so success stories are, are secondary. So I, I mean, I but I, I I do think that there are important initiatives going on, and I I, I think that you know. I, in many instances, half the solution to a problem is acknowledging the problem exists, um, and there are there are efforts to define problems. I think there are structural um, initiatives that are, are being made, not only in expanding broadband access, but also in creating um, sort of hubs of digital literacy, so to speak, in in relatively disadvantaged communities and so on, uh, for populations that that. Um, 
that suffer from, from, from low levels of digital literacy or, or access to digital skills. The, the one that comes to mind is, I think it's the Newark School of Data Science, um, which is a high school that was just created, right? And, and these, these types of things, they, they carry with them tremendous momentum. Um, and I think, I, so, so I'm, you know, acknowledging all of these concerns and, 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 and how far we have to go, I think we are taking the right steps and we are asking important questions in, in acknowledging um, how significant the problem is. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, before I get to the last question that I have, which is the advice for libraries, um, you know, I feel like that's a really strong one to, to close on, but Mimi had a really interesting question in chat that I figured it would be easier if she would jump in and ask that. It's a, um, so Mimi, if you don't mind unmuting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, you put it on the podium. Okay, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I think these two uh, related questions, I, I think I have been wrestling um, uh, with uh, myself and I wondered, because uh, did that, um, during the presentation, I think there were a lot of um, um, some crossing uh, over thoughts and um, and the issues. But then these two are actually um, that I felt that I would like to hear directly from um, the panelists today. So um, I don't know. Um... I, I read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want Do you want to go on, or do, shall I just um, address the question that you put here in the I think that's what uh, Andrea is having uh, us on, I think. So I, I appreciate your uh, sharing thoughts with us today. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can take a first step and then open it to, to Scott and Diane. But um, I, I mean, I think in my opinion, this this was something that I was thinking about in, in, in my presentation as well. Um, you know, specifying specifying the problems. I played with the presentation a little bit, so I, I'm not sure what final wording I chose. Careful problem definition, right? So I, in my mind, when I'm saying, when I'm using the term careful problem definition, it's exactly uh, kind of referring to what you're mentioning about competency-based skills and um, what, uh, yeah, competency, competencies-based assessments. Um, so, so, but, but I think the bigger question is what are the competencies and, and, and how can we ensure that these competencies are, are again valid in, in real life settings in real life contexts. Um, so, so I totally agree with your point, I, I would carry it a, for a, a step further to also think about um, just just validating this right um it could be by by as scott mentioned you know teacher evaluations five years down the line but you know thinking about people who are successful in their jobs um and and digital literacy assessments of them as well you know like we know that these people are have the skills that we're testing on so let's measure those guys or those those individuals and then compare those measures to individuals who are, who are less sophisticated in terms of their digital skills or digital literacy to identify gaps um the latter question i'm a little bit less clear so i don't i mean i i understand the question i don't have a lot of you know interesting thoughts on this um I think that was more on, on the the practice side of things. I think uh, Scott and Diane, uh, both of you been around in this field for, for a long time. And so, and Scott has done an amazing work um, in this um, workforce development uh, space. So, so Scott, I think you can also, uh, yeah. Uh, I gotta say, I actually really uh, love what Greg suggested about Measuring people who are already successful, I, I, that, I love that. That's such a really, really good idea. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I know that there's this sort of sense of, and I, I think we may be in a bit of a chicken and egg scenario with, with some of this from like a difference between the practicality, um, what tools are there. I think that working for the point of, we do have tools right now because we have to put numbers to it, you know, particularly in library world, if we don't have numbers, um, we don't get paid. And I, I know it sounds terrible, but I kind of say this a lot, but uh, a lot of library service, I think, you know, there's a way that we want it to be and we want it to be very open, but, um, you know, and it's Diane's here, I'm gonna say this, you know, if I'm not, if I'm not working towards an industry recognized credential, 
um, you know, Diane or any other workforce funding entity is going to have a, a lot harder of a time even just sending clients to us, let alone uh, finding ways to partner with us if we're not working towards something that's going to be, um, you know, a recordable or payable benchmark. So I think you have to start from that perspective. Um, and then, you know, you have a question of, what would be the industry, you know, recognized credentialing that we would talk about at those levels? So, you know, we've been fortunate that the, you know, again, I sound like I'm pitching them and I'm not, it's just like we use it because it's kind of the best option right now is IC3. We had looked at doing uh, the CompTIA A+, plus, um, which is on the hardware troubleshooting side of things. It's still kind of a tier up from it. I am a huge fan. Um, I know Jen Nelson brought in from, you know, her, uh, from Minnesota, that North Star, which we've been launching um, a lot under the Hub Spoke Navigator Partners thing, and the feedback we've been hearing about North Star is phenomenal. Um, and we sort of have been treating it as part of continuum. Uh, basically, just when we use the the Spark under IC3 as our um, assessment, uh, clients who score below 350, which is really, you know, having a hard time using the mouse to to take the test. We put them on North Star. When they finish North Star, we shift them to the IC3, which has tiering. And then we've been um, a Microsoft uh, certification site because it's also under Pearson for a long time. Um, and we find that by the time they get through with the IC3, they have the foundational skills they would need to get the Microsoft certs. Um, and I think having a way to better differentiate all this would be good because we still, even though we don't do that many Microsoft certs a year, we still put it on all the flyers uh, for the same reason we advertise the GED program because if people people come in because they want the Microsoft certs and then you can kind of be like, but here are all the things you have to do to get up to it. You know, you can't come in having no skills and then go towards a Microsoft certification. So we have, we have built an in-house continuum of digital literacy certification. Um, that we feel kind of works pretty well. And we've been working on sort of getting people to adopt a similar um, thing. Um, is it uh, perfect? No, but I think if we can at least start from some sort of like commonality of this is at least the credential we're looking for for basic computer stuff. Um, I think that that gets us to a place that once we're all in the same place, we can go, okay, what's working, what's not working. And so, yeah, um, I think there's practicality to it that we have to go with industry recognized credentialing and we have to to go with uh, all those uh, as well. I'm sorry, I ended up completely rambling there. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna pass off to Diane <laughs> and apologize. Scott, I didn't feel that. I I, I always learn from you. Um, you know, something I'm looking at is, you know, we, we talk about with the federal, oh, let me start back, with the federal grants that uh, our office, my office operates, um, industry recognized credential uh, is one of our performance metrics. And several years ago, when this was, uh, when we owe a Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act of 2014 and uh, uh, began, we, we kept talking about, you know, it has to be exam based. Uh, you know, we're telling industry what they need. But I think we're always going, I, in my opinion, we're going about it incorrectly. I think industries need to tell us. We need to listen more, take notes, and build credential programs based on their needs. Um, I think, in my humble opinion, is, um, you know, we, we, we have apprenticeships, but we don't promote apprenticeships as much as we need to. We, you know, we're going to be beginning pre-apprenticeship programs here. Um, you know, I know Scott and, and many of my, my colleagues across the state are utilizing apprenticeship programs. I think, um, and, and, you know, there's a whole mentoring component with apprenticeship programs, which is so valued and so important. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, take a train the trainer with the German American Chamber of Commerce, which was invaluable in my understanding of the German model and how they go about uh, training their workers and uh, in, in, in apprenticeships. And I don't know why I'm going off on apprenticeships, but um, in essence, <laughs> I apologize. I, I have, uh, I can go off as well, but um, my, my train of thought for the, you know, the industry recognized credentials is that we also need to look at micro credentials because I think um, there's a huge push and I've been pushing this with the state employment and training commission on their performance committee for about three years now. And there's a, in my, you know, um, 
uh, SUNY in New York had a task force in 2018 that developed a wonderful report uh, that talked about micro-credentialing and how all SUNYs are now utilizing micro-credentialing and what micro-credentialing is and not necessarily needing you know, a, you know, a whole degree or even a certification in a specific topic. Um, but a, you know, having knowledge so that you can get that job so that you can get trained, you know, and continue on down the road with furthering your education or certifications. So I think there's, there's a need for looking at micro credentialing. Yeah. I think that we talk about industry recognized credentials and I, and I, I'm, I'm a proponent that I think that we need to listen to employers, find out what their needs are, and then be able to work with our job seek, you know, as, as my director and I always talk about, we have the supply and the demand. Uh, you know, the employers are, are definitely our demand and we, we really need to supply them with qualified workers. Um, and that means bridging the digital divide. That means bringing people, um, giving them the skill sets that they need and meeting them where they are uh, and not, you know, assuming like, uh, you know, Greg had said government, you know, getting out of our own way. We, you know, I, I swore at a college I'd never work for a government entity. And I spent 29 years doing it. And, <laughs> um, uh, but I, I'm still, I'm still optimistic and hopeful that we are going to be able to uh, create. We're, you know, here locally in Middlesex, I can only speak for my area, but we are. And I know Scott has been doing this for a number of years. And you know, we are really trying to look at the needs of employers. We are lo really looking at the needs of job seekers and really trying to identify that skills gap and measure it and in some way. But a lot of it's done by listening to employers and gaining insight on their needs. So, you know, one of the, you know, there's a huge push right now on, um, in my space on work-based learning and what work-based learning is and, is, you know, what it's not. So in essence, work-based learning, in my opinion, has to do with pre-apprenticeships, apprenticeships, on-the-job training, incumbent worker training, um, all of those things that make it up, you know. So when we look at digital literacy, when we look at digital skills and, and mm -hmm. the digital divide, I think we need to look at the, the yeah. job seekers and the underemployed and, of course, the, you know, the individuals who don't have access. That's obviously first. I mean, some of the, um, the advice that I'd have for the libraries and the communities around workforce development is to continue to seek state and federal grants uh, to increase access to technology programs and, and staff that can assist job seekers and un underemployed individuals with a one-on-one -on -one assistance. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot around, and, and um, Greg, thank you for this because, you know, conducting assessments and evaluations, I think is so paramount. I, one of the things that as we're trying to develop our skill up connection sites, and the reason we called it skill up is because we've been branding um, our online learning platform in the county of Middlesex. So we are looking to bring services to the libraries. Uh, you know, after your uh, career connections grant ended, we recognized there was a huge gap. And we really wanted to bring services back to the library uh, from a local perspective. And then of course the pandemic hit. And now we're thinking, okay, so we have to retrain how we think so we can provide some virtual, definitely virtual services. We've been doing workshops, um, Sayreville and South Brunswick were our two pilot sites mm -hmm. that came on last year in August and uh, November. And we've been doing virtual workshops for them. I think we did hybrid workshops initially for uh, Sayreville. Um, but on different topics, everything from entrepreneurship to, you know, how to build a resume to interviewing to networking to transferable job skills, you know, whatever the topics are. But I think one of the things that I felt was lacking, uh, and I believe is still lacking, is that we don't have a good handle on who's coming through the door. We really, you know, asking five questions because we surveyed some people and I, I know the libraries only wanted the one you know, only wanted five questions. Well, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I, I don't know how much you can get. Five questions is, is very limited, um, but we're continuing. I, I think we have to continue to identify what the needs are of the patrons that are walking through your door uh, and how we can, and then working with our workforce development boards, working another, you know, another thing is, is collaborating with the One Stop Career Centers across the state, collaborating with your workforce development board, um, I, I know we've, we have a really good partnership with many libraries and I have many of the librarians sitting on some of the subcommittees and they are wonderful. 
and very insightful. So thank you very much to all of you um, who, who volunteer your time. Um, and, and, you know, connecting with us as we're, as they're, and they can hear the discussions with industry, um, bringing that to the forefront, you know, making sure that there's that collaboration and partnership is in, uh, is paramount. And I think um, WIOA uh, of 2014 is being real, is currently being uh, in the process of being reauthorized. So one of the, uh, one of the added bonuses is they want to make libraries an affiliate site, which would be wonderful. It should be. Um, and then my, I'll leave, lastly, just <laughs> access to digital tools. That's it. <laughs> That's uh, all I got. <laughs> can I just jump in real quick? Because I think uh, you hit a few things that, that are really important. And, when we and Scott, want, if you can yeah. weave this into your, your advice for libraries, your thing you want to leave. I am going there. Yes, <laughs> actually. Uh, so one of the things that I, I think we need to see more not from the library side of things, but that you know we can't divorce this from the idea of accessing funding and accessing partnerships. And I think sometimes when we're dealing with um, a federal or a county or a state entity, there's a gap between the things that we can all agree that basic digital literacy is important, but if we can't get it to a place where it's a benchmarkable, it's very hard to get service for the lowest, lowest levels covered. We ran into this forever with ESL, right? Like everyone agrees ESL is important, but it's very difficult to find funding to cover a really basic ESL because it's not going to necessarily meet something that's going to be a payable benchmark. And I think on the digital literacy side, we run into that as well. Um, how do I convert getting somebody set up on a email to a source of um, funding or support? And we know that that's really important or getting them simply at the level we're talking pre like the IC3 I've been shooting at, but we need a, a change, I have to say, on the workforce side of things. I know that this is like significantly higher than that today, and I'm not pointing this at you. <laughs> I know you're on my side here, but I'm just saying we need a change in the support that happens. I do think a lot of it comes down to sort of a confusion as to um, how early on in something that becomes a job seeking uh, skill build does the Department of Labor want to fund versus something that they would have said, but isn't that Department of Ed and then Department of Ed's like, we don't do things for adults, you know? And so there's this whole area of people that are left behind. And certainly there's programmatic decisions that we've made that are based not necessarily on what we think are best practices overall, but have to be based on answering um, stability of funding. Um, I do think building off of what Greg said, as far as numbers and, and that, and speaking common language, not to again, show the Partners Plus program, but that's really one of the big things that we're doing. So Diane talked about uh, getting information from people coming in the door. Diane, you're gonna love this. My libraries are all using LACES. They're all using LACES. Uh, so we're getting that information because we, we agree with you. We need that to be able to work with our partners better. So we've standardized that we're using, um, again, the, as Diane mentioned, I used to, I used to work there and we took a lot of that and said, if we want to work with workforce, how do we do that? Um, so the idea that everyone is using the same uh, measurement, all of our sites are using the Spark as the measurement, all of our sites are using North Star, we've come up with standardized goals. And this is across not just our hubs and spokes, but also our navigators, uh, sorry, the navigators, uh, because the more we can all as libraries work together with some degree of uniformity, the more we're also a lobbying block. Right. Like, I mean, we can't ignore that. I know we all want to sort of have our degree of flexibility and have our whatever, but to sort of be able to bring attention to this and to, to sort of be at the table to make these arguments, I knew he was going to make an appearance. There's the cap. Uh, there's the cap. Right, to pull it all together to be one unified program versus... My numbers that. need to be able to talk to your numbers, need to be able to talk to somebody else's numbers for us to show those big numbers to somebody else. I'm very sorry about the cap. No, uh, so good. I just want Greg to be able to say his last, uh, you know, this is my, my final advice to the attendees. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 really to start thinking carefully about data collection um, and 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 how we're going to communicate results or how to communicate results in a convincing manner, right? If if we want to convey the success of a program or or that results were achieved, how can we do that in a credible fashion? Um, and and uh, you know, I think I think from from sitting on this panel for two hours, we're moving in the right direction. Um, 
and and there's a lot of you know there's a lot of data being collected there's a lot of knowledge exchange but but really just just being intentional with it is is will 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 do wonders i think well thank you so much um for your participation today your time your expertise i hope that everyone who um, attended today learned something or has a new question to ask um, Diane, I think I might contact you later just to get a little bit more information about skill up because there were some sure. questions about that. Um, and people in the chat, I saw the comments about, um, you know, even the difficulties with logging people into some of these things being a barrier. Um, and, you know, we would love to be able to keep some email addresses and passwords on on hand because those people come in every day, but, you know, obviously we can't and so you know, some, so thank you for everything that all of you do to just get people logged into these things. So um, when we uh, close out today, there will be a link to our evaluation forum. Um, if you could click on that and fill it out, we would greatly appreciate it. I'm also going to put it into the chat. Um, that information helps us to know what we can do in the future and um, whether you learned something from today's session. So thank you once more. I'm going to stop recording now.